Welcome to Turnaround Tuesday. We're so glad that you are with us on July 5th. I hope everybody had an absolutely fantastic July 4th holiday. Ours was a little short. It was the shortest fireworks I think we've ever seen in Washington, D.C. I don't know why that is, but it was brief and not really spectacular. It was just, well, brief. So we're relying really heavily on all of you to join us and together let's get into a celebration of the Lord and a celebration of his heart for us, all that he's entrusted to us. And on the day we celebrate the sacrifice of our forefathers to establish a nation and freedom, let's celebrate God's heart as a father to us. So Chris Mitchell, would you mind starting us off today? Father, we are grateful today that it is for freedom that you have made us free. The yes. sacrifice of, of your son's cross. We thank you today, Lord, that we've entered into a place of liberty and freedom by the spirit, that wherever the spirit is, there is freedom, there is liberty. So, Lord, we stand in that place today. We thank you for causing there to be a, a flow and articulation of that truth by the spirit. As we communicate today, give birth uh, to this new birth of freedom. Uh, that will span this nation, Lord, that will release the captives from subjugation, that will cause them to walk free uh, from the chains of bondage, that will release shackles and remove blinders off of the eyes. We pray for that type of release today as we move in the spirit of liberty uh, today. We bless you. We honor you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Chris. Well, we're so glad to be joined today by Chris Mitchell, Adam Schindler, the legendary Adam Schindler, who is en route to an undisclosed location. <laughs> and, uh, we uh, have a heart today, just my heart is bursting to pray for sons and daughters. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really an incredible time out there. And I think people's hearts are being sifted their belief systems are being sifted. And, um, you know, there's no better time than right now to pray. And I, I, coming from Washington, D.C. here, it, it seems like um, um, our freedoms are somewhat in the balance. There's a liberal world order out there that uh, has been articulated that is really firm on open defiance of God and teaching our children to remain in open defiance of God. You know what? The Lord is bringing a turnaround. He's not just bringing a turnaround according to the law. He's bringing a turnaround where he's going to restore our hearts back to him in a way that is profound. This, this whole movement, Turnaround Tuesday movement, is predicated on Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And in the New Testament, it's expanded upon. It says, and I'm going to turn the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. You know, there is wisdom to righteousness. The wages of sin is still death. I, I had a conversation with a brother out on Capitol Hill. And um, it was very interesting because he was raised in church, but he went an entirely different way. And he actually quoted that scripture to me that the wages of sin is death. And my heart was leaping. Yes, that's true. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. He died and rose again to redeem us and forgive us of our sins. We can have a new beginning. The end of your road can become the gateway of new beginnings because Jesus paid the price for your redemption. And I think in this season, guys, that's something that we are going to know in an increased manner and our sons and daughters are going to know. Amen. You guys are the yeah. strong silent types now. <laughs> Chris, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I we can, can hear you. Go ahead, Adam. Adam. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. If I cut out, then I'll stay off so I won't keep popping back in and out. But the 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 thing that I'm hearing about that is that death is separation from God. Right? And that's what happens 
when Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden and they broke fellowship with the father, not because they disobeyed his law, though they did. They broke fellowship with the father because they tried to be with God, to be like God without being with God. Right. And then when they left the presence of God, they died, but they were still alive. And so what we understand and what we're praying for about life from death is about a reconnection and a restoration of the connection to the father. That's right. The wages of sin is a disconnection from dad. And the world hears that verse and they hear the wages of sin is judgment. The wages of sin is public shaming. The wages of sin is no longer being part of your legalistic fundamentalist church, right? But that isn't what Paul's talking about, and that isn't what Jesus is talking about. Sin separates us from dad. And if we live our lives unreconciled without the redemption of the son, then we live our lives as orphans, and we never see dad at the end when it's, when it's all said and done. And so I just, I just know this culture wants to use the word sin as judgment and judgment for being a bad person. But sin is just missing the mark of the glory God made you for, which means you have to aim at something, you know? And so I do just want to pray really briefly about understanding that sin doesn't mean you're a bad person and you're evil, though I think we all have that part of our hearts. But sin means you've missed the glory that God put you in and we're separated from the Father. Well, let me just pray into that real quickly. Living God, we thank you that, that you have set a target for us, Father. That you have said we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That you made us to radiate your glory in the earth. You made us to demonstrate what it's like to have a Father present in the earth who is revealed through the Son. So, Father, we pray right now. Um, for everyone that is struggling, God, with the wages of sin, whether they're raging against it, using the Bible as a weapon to reaffirm their atheism, or whether they're struggling with their own personal experience of being caught in cycles of sin. Father, we pray for the young men, God, that are trapped in sin and anger. Father, we just call for redemption and a return to the Father's heart. Yes. Father, we just declare over this young man this young gentleman um, in D.C., we declare over you, be reconciled to the Father. He's not holding your sins against you. He's not holding the fact that you ran from him, that you were separated, that you were hurt, that you were disconnected. He doesn't hold that against you. He's calling you home. And we declare that over him and over the sons that need to return to the Father in Jesus' holy name. Yeah, Adam, even today, as I've been driving and doing errands, I keep hearing this song in my spirit and the and the words go, there's got to be something more than this. There's got to be something better than this. Yes. And I, I feel like that's really what God's putting his hand on in, in this season. And even for us as believers, like we can get caught in cycles, we can get caught in all kinds of things. And all we're doing is living below what it is God has really, the gift that he's given us. It's like having all the money in the world and, and deciding to only live off $10 in the bank account. It, it doesn't make any sense. We're living below the best he has for us. And there's so many people who have, know that there's something better than this. There's something more to life, but they just can't figure out how to find it. So, Father, we pray for those and we reach out to those who know that there's got to be something better than this. There's got to be something more than this. Father, I pray for every struggling Christian. I pray for every struggling non-Christian. I yeah. pray for everyone that I literally see you holding your hands out and saying, mm -hmm. come to me. Come, I will fill that place that you're looking to get fulfilled by other things. And the biggest thing that happens to us is we put idolatry in between oh. us and God. And idolatry yeah. is anything we love more than him. It can yeah. be drugs. It can be relationship. It can be food. It can be all kinds of things. But we're just living 
below what it is the Lord wants to bring to us. So, Father, Mm. I thank you that your arms are outstretched for many. I thank you that your arms are outstretched for the children that all of us are praying for, for the parents we're praying for, for the friends we're praying for. The enemy is after relationships right now. He's after relationships between family members, between uh, church members. He's after relationships. And Father, I thank you that you're going to turn that situation around and you're going to bring people into the fold so that they can live at their highest destiny and the greatest gifting of our lives that you have for us in Jesus name. Yeah. So good. Yeah. I I just want to like pick up on something Jolene just said, because God is not, excuse me. God is not holding your sins against you. That's all settled by the cross. Now he wants to bring conviction, but why does he want to bring conviction? This is, part of the dialogue that I just like spaced on when uh, talking with my friend, it, sin does hurt you. It hurts you. It brings a breach between you and God, number one. And number two, it, it defiles you in your own being. Yeah. And it even sets up a, a, a measure of defilement that goes through the generational line afterwards. Yeah. It, it, it is not without consequence, just like gravity is not without consequence. Mm-hmm. The theology of sin didn't start with, you know, God is a harsh taskmaster trying to, you know, keep you in line. He wants to protect you from what can harm you. That's why he puts boundaries down in the first place. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've been reflecting this weekend on Hosea 2, where Hosea's bride is married to him, but goes after other lovers. Yes, sir. And... Yeah thinks that she can get more pleasure from the lover down the street than than him. More pleasure, more, you know, connections, more promotions, whatever, you know, thinks that life's going to be better uh, by violating the covenant that has been created and breaching it in order to get something that she feels like she's being robbed of within the covenant. The reason why we live to a standard is because we're keeping covenant with God, not from obligation, but from the heart. We want to please him just like I want to please Jolene and, and Jolene wants to please me. It, it's a covenant relationship that we have with the Lord. And he says, I'm, I am like a bridegroom to you. I'm going to watch over you, protect you, defend you. I'm going to be strong on your behalf. I'm going to I'm going to protect you from things that you know about things that you don't know about and I'm going to enrich your life. But we look at some of the things that he says these are my standards that are going to help you in life and go no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go my own way here. And we think what we choose is going to free us. We think that lover that we choose over God's going to free us when actually it leads us into greater bondage. The enemy is the one standing over you, accusing you. He's known as the accuser of the brethren. He is the one trying to capture you. He is the one using every way possible, including legalism, to try and push you into a a marginalized stance where you become subjugated to him. Mm -hmm. And what you thought was going to free you actually brings you under the enemy's subjugation. Jesus died and rose again to free you. Listen to this chapter, this verse, Isaiah 49, 25. We've prayed it every single time that we have been on this call. Um, It's Isaiah 49, 20. I'll begin with verse 24. Can the prey be taken from the mighty man? Can the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Surely, says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty man can be taken uh, and the prey of the tyrant will be rescued, for I will contend with the ones who contend with you, and I will save your children. Listen, we all have fallen for the enemy's vices and is the enemy's devices. We've all fallen short of the glory. There's subjugation in all of our lives and defilement in all our, of our lives where we have capitulated and chosen the enemy over God. 
the Lord is coming now with keys for your deliverance. Now, it's just because God gives you keys for your deliverance doesn't mean that he delivers you. It means you have to exercise your own will in the process. You've got to take a stand. But he's giving you a key and he's saying, for you and for your children, I will contend with the one who contends with you and I will save your children. We pray that, Father God, right now. We say that the captives of the mighty men, the captives of this vicious, strong man, who looked really great in the beginning, but then the face of evil uh, began to be shown. And we realized that we became subjugated by the very thing that we thought was going to set us free. The Lord says, let my children go. The Lord is confronting your strong man right now. And he's saying, enough is enough. That's right. Let my children go. We pray for everybody on this broadcast we pray for everybody that uh, uh is uh within our hearing and for people that we have been praying for we just thank you that right now you are bringing a break between the subjugation of the enemy and the freedom that you offer you are shifting us and giving us a revelation of the bondage we've been in and we know there's only one way through and that is through jesus christ to gain freedom he whom the sun sets free is free yeah. indeed yeah. So we just receive your freedom now, and we release each one of you to start on this freedom journey in Jesus' name. And, yeah, and jo- go ahead, Chris. No, 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 please, Jolene, go, go ahead. Well, I, I just was thinking about a conversation Jesus had with me a long time ago about, about quote-unquote sin, and and it has to do with us all struggling with certain areas in our life. We all struggle with it. And and the Lord was basically saying to me that, you know, maybe someone else is dealing with drug abuse or dealing with sleeping around or dealing. He said, those areas are just as hard for them as the area you're struggling with to get over is for you. So there is this place of humility that is needed in the body of Christ and a place of pastoring that I think we haven't had um, to the degree that we need to. to un- we need to understand that people's sin is hard for them to overcome, but they're also many times trying to overcome it in their own selves. We mm-hmm. all fall short of the glory. We all need God to love God, and that is a strange terminology for some people to understand but we need the lord to help us in every area of our lives with and the mercy that we need from god i may not be struggling with that area but i'm struggling with some something else and i think many people think christians are judgmental and they have no mercy and they have no compassion and that is really what is, becomes a front to people in their sin. It's an affront to them. If we come at them that we are compassionate and merciful and that, and that we sin as well, we need to come with humility. And that's what I pray for the body of Christ, that we will begin to be humble in areas and we aren't any better in our areas that we are struggling in as anyone else is. That's so good. Go ahead, you know, Chris. Yes, I, I, <laughs> I'm listening to uh, what you're saying, Jolene, and it, it's so true. Uh, that that um, perspective and uh, really approach by the body of Christ has been weaponized to divide and bring a deep in the chasm between people and intimacy and fellowship and union with the Father. And so one of the things that I I am recognizing, even with what we're dealing with, with contending for our sons and daughters, the things that are facing them, uh, some of them, we're going to have to correct behaviors, uh, repent of things that we have um, modeled before them, because it was those things that kind of framed uh, this, this, snare, if you will, that the enemy has used uh, to entrap them and to keep them alienated from the life of God. Right. And so uh, let me give you an example of what I'm what I'm saying. When we want to have a personal relationship with one with someone, we don't go buy books on sociology. 
you spend time with the person. You don't broadly study the behaviors of, right. of humanity. You invest relationally with the person in order to build a relationship. And in many cases, what we've done is we've presented God theologically to a generation and have not brought forward the intimacy, the, the personal dynamic, the love of the Father, the redemption that we've personally experienced, realizing that the reality is this, that Acts 1.8 says when, when the Holy Spirit, this was Jesus' promise to the 120 who were tearing in Jerusalem, he said, and you will receive power after which the Holy Spirit has come upon you, power to be witnesses. And the word witness in Greek is the word martyrion, from where we get the word martyr, that it literally took the Holy Spirit in us to be able to lay down just like you said, uh, uh, Jolene, what you were talking about, it takes God. It's not native, all of us. It took God for us to even choose righteousness or choose his ways above the proclivities of our, of our flesh. And it was God's mercy that brought us into that place and brought God's goodness and his own strength and virtue that empowered us to live in that way. But yet when we're speaking to others, those realities don't always come forward. And it has, it has been, that has been leveraged by the enemy to push a generation even further who feel like that there's no mercy in this. There's no room for mercy. There's no room for the goodness of God. There's no room for this God of love that we speak about, but they don't, they haven't experienced sometimes in the context of church, in the ecclesia and even in relationships they have not experienced that dynamic. Uh, and so I'm, I really wanna just pray for just a moment that Father, we just believe right now that even in this hour where there is so much contention, Lord, uh, that is taking place where the enemy is literally losing his grip and his hold on the minds and <laughs> on the wills of your sons and daughters. We yep. just thank you, Father, that in the same process that you are causing there to be an unveiling where we're going to begin to perceive you. Your, your word says in Jeremiah 2.13, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and yes, for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We decree, Lord, that your people are returning to the fountain, to the source of living water, which is a yep. living, relational, intimate, covenantal connection where you're the God that makes provision for the deepest longings of the human soul, yep. that only in and through you, not through the hewn cisterns of our own efforts that are dependent upon seasons in order for us to feel worthy or to feel happy or to feel joy. We thank you, Lord, that we're returning and our children after us are returning to the fountain of living water. And you are satisfying the thirst of the of the longing human spirit. We bless you for doing it in our sons and daughters. We thank you, Lord, for giving them a drink from the well that never once dry and causing those streams of living water to flow out of your sons and daughters in this hour in Jesus name. Yeah, it reminds me of Isaiah 58 when it's talking about fasting and it's, God's like, is this the kind of fast I've chosen? The pointing of the finger, how we point the finger and point out their, their issues and their, and the Lord says, the chains of injustice and the cords of the yoke will be broken by us humbling ourselves by us not pointing in the finger by us just being we have to repent as the body for for pointing out other people's sin when it's really a humility kind of thing god is after right now and he's saying i don't need you to fast i need you to stop talking about each other i need you to stop do i need you to stop pointing the finger and putting that yoke on them you're trying to take a, there's also the scripture and God says it to, to me often about you put a heavier yoke on them as you're trying yep. to take one off of them. You put yep. double the yoke on them, that, that you're twice the, twice the son of, I can't remember what the actual verbiage is and I'm doing a very poor job of, of describing it, but you're, you do doing, it awesome. <laughs> you're doing twice the damage 
of the very thing you're trying to correct. So, Father, we just take the pointing of the finger, Lord. We repent on the as the body of Christ of the pointing of the finger. We're seeking justice. We're seeking a way to take bondage off of people. But our ways, your ways are so much higher than ours. Your ways actually free people. Your ways take the yoke off of people. Our ways yeah. have actually doubled the bondage which they're in. And Father, I ask that you continue to work on the hearts of each wow. one of us, that we humble ourselves and pray. Humble ourselves and pray. It takes action and prayer, Lord. And we ask you to forgive us as the body of Christ for not showing your heart to those who are in trouble and in sin. And I thank you even in John's conversation that it ended up in the end that they actually had talked through enough things that they parted in a good way and not a negative way. So Father, I thank you for encounters like that, that yeah. we will begin to see people and be able to talk through things with the anger um, not as elevated and the pointing of the finger taken away, Jesus, we ask for that yeah, in your yeah. name. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the difficulty of that kind of uh, dialogue is it requires an open heart. Most often, um, the reason why we accuse others, we try to invalidate others to justify ourselves. Yes, sir. And genuine dialogue requires an open heart from both parties, right? I, I think this generation is uniquely adept at making the heart closed and making the heart open when when desired. But there's so many things that have numbed everybody's heart, our own hearts, certainly. Yeah, and I think, um, Lord, we are asking that you tenderize our hearts once again, that you take away a heart of stone out of our flesh and give us a heart of flesh and write your decrees on the tablets of our hearts, God, so that we will yeah. follow them intuitively and know you intuitively at the core of our being. And Lord, we're asking that the heavy hand of a stony heart be removed from yes. our own hearts and, yes. and also the hearts of those that we are in dialogue with. Yeah. Jesus yeah. yeah. Can I tell you guys a quick little story? Sure. About this issue. Um, sure. I, in my twenties, I got a philosophy degree in Eastern religion, and I raised Judeo Christian, but I wanted to know what the rest of the you know four billion people on the planet thought. So I studied Islam and Hinduism and Shintoism and Taoism and. You know, I, I stayed away from Scientology and Mormonism. I didn't think that was really worth my time. But I studied all of these major religious books and I got done with college and I was a religious intellectual. You know, I mean, I, I was I was locked and loaded with with all all of the theology and all of the doctrines. I'm like, no, that's Buddhist. And that's Shunyata. They're talking about Maya. The whole world's an illusion. And so I would I would go out high on my religious charger for war down to my downtown area in my little town fort collins and i would go out and i would look for people to minister to and it's air quotes right because it wasn't really ministering I, I, this, is, this is this is ehs for me this is before whole i would go down to minister to people it basically looked like me sitting at the bar having a Guinness, waiting for somebody to talk to me, them telling me their theology of the world and me showing them why they're wrong. And so- You got a beer out of it, that's great. Yeah, I did. Uh, but one night I went down and I walked past this group of, of, I mean, they were hippies and there was like 15 of them in a circle and they were all talking about spiritual issues. And I walked past and I heard this weed slurred dialogue and I was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to go and talk with these folks. So I sit down in this circle. They make space for me and they're talking about the circle of life and unity and oneness. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh, 
I'm categorizing everything and I'm sitting there biding my time waiting to drop the hammer and lead all these heathens to Jesus. When this, <laughs> when this guy, I'll call him Qualtaka. He's, he was a native American guy. I don't know his name, but he comes into the circle and he sits down and he's totally drunk and he smiles. He's got like three teeth and he sits down in the circle and they start talking and Qualtaka had waited as long as me to share. He immediately hears them talking about this and he's like, no man, it's not the circle of unity, it's bleeping Jesus. And you guys can know God if you just know bleeping Jesus. And every time he said Jesus, it was preceded by a very affectionate curse word. And I was sitting there. <laughs> While drunk, American cussed his way through the gospel. And it was the most bizarre evangelistic presentation I'd ever seen in my life. But, and I was sitting there and I was like, God, what should I do? You know, this was a spiritual discipline I hardly practiced at that point, but I was like, God, what should I do? And he said, just stay quiet and listen. And what happened, y'all, was... Qualtaka cussed way through the testimony of Jesus, but I felt the whole, I, I, the whole circle changed and they started talking about Jesus. And he said, you can know the father if you know the son and the son loves you. You know, it had the F word in it every time, but still. And <laughs> after about 15 more minutes of this, I got up to leave and I didn't say a single word. And I got up to leave and they all stood up and they gave me hugs. And I'm telling you guys, this was a moment that changed my life because I'm standing mm. there hugging hippies and I can feel mm. the self-righteousness dripping off of me. You know, wow. I came in on, their, on my religious high horse for war and I left on my foolish, dumb donkey. You know, <laughs> quiet, <laughs> silent. And I remember getting on my bicycle, riding home. And I was like, what just happened? Like these people loved me. They were together. All of my religious knowledge meant nothing. And I remember the loving words my father said, Adam, never get so intellectual that you forget to love. Mm, yeah. And that, that was this breaking point for me when I discovered that the original sin was about mankind trying to be like God without actually being with God. We traded yes, information, sir. we traded our information about God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is this word knowledge is da'af, and it means cognitive, mental skill, and ability. And we traded the tree of life, intimacy, connection with God for knowledge about God. And that was the that's, thing that's I'd right. done my whole life. And that's, right. that's what this generation, and we've taught our kids to do this, right? Learn about God, don't encounter him. Right. He's in a book on a page, not loosed right. out in the world, you know, and that's why I think this next generation and people like, you know, Sean Foyt and this Let Us Worship thing and lots of different movements for this younger generation. There's an encounter, a tangible, experiential, not just a blind emotionalism of smoke and fog, and, but a genuine encounter with the power and the presence of the living God, you know. And that's, that's where the new freedom movements, I mean, that's, it's here. And it's here because people are encountering the love of the Father. I just want to read this one, one verse and pray. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, yeah. for love is from God. And whoever loves have, has been born of God. Does not love does not know God. Does God love in this is love not that we have loved god he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins so father we just declare scripture out over everyone that is trying to be gooder because of knowledge all the people that are trying to their own righteousness through the things that they know things that they say that they don't believe they don't believe in god they don't believe in pro-life they don't believe in politics they don't believe 
that's all a knowledge assent to your heart father we just declare in jesus name like jolene said we need god to love god you us jesus right. so father i pray for this generation of young people father that they would lay down their knowledge needing to know and they would encounter the great i am that they would see the manifestation of god the father in their midst because you loved us long before we were lovable long before we had knowledge long before we had anything that was valuable in the earth you loved us so father we just declare and release the love of jesus over this generation of people that need yeah. you we pray and declare these things in jesus name amen so good what you got to say there chris mitchell let's well, just you know we um we touched on it multiple times already but it's just it's, it's interesting to me that the Lord in 2020, um, he began speaking to me about, he, he said, this next uh, era that you're moving into uh, as the body of Christ, he said, it's going to be defined by Psalm 34, 8. It's going to be a taste and see era um, where there's the, the shift from describing realities that we have not experienced ourselves. Uh, that we've gained language for and, and vocabulary for, the Lord says, you know, was saying to me, I'm I'm bringing my people out of that mode where there everything is type and shadow, where there's no there's no real substance of encounter behind it, because that is what draws people into into the living reality. That's it's First John chapter one, the first three verses, the things which we've seen and heard which our eyes have seen and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, these things we declare to you so that you may step into this koinonia, this fellowship, this intimate union that we hold with the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. So the means of declaration, declaring the things that we've actually encountered, the revelatory encounter of a person, not a theology, and I'm not trying to knock theology, but I am saying that it's it is void of of imparting the life of God when it does not come from a place where you've encountered the person behind the text. And all throughout this journey, God is even drawing this generation into deeper encounter. And that goes for those of us who know him, those of us in the body of Christ. But the generations that we're calling forward, we're not going to call them forward into just neat theological boxes. We're not calling them forward into just possessing language and vocabulary and vernacular. We're calling them forward into the yeah. experience of a living reality, to the substance of encounter that brings you into Psalm 34, 8, tasting and seeing that he's good not just describing his goodness or talking about how good he is but the heart posture is not persuaded that he's good because it it's it it is devoid of the encounter of his goodness do you is, is that making sense what i'm saying yes. because so that's that's what what i want to pray into for just a moment because i believe this is the it's been the missing piece of what we've been doing yes, in the sir. body of Christ. And it's been the missing piece, even in our parenting of our children, because they've learned our theology, but they haven't met the God of our encounter. And it goes back to what, what, what uh, Jolene was saying earlier. We, the, the modeling and the exemplifying of the characteristics that we've come to know, and we came to know them through, in, through encountering him in that way. And uh, before I pray, just say this. You look at the scriptures, it's all throughout the scriptures. We talked about Judges 6 last week, where, where Gideon calls the name of the place um, Jehovah uh, Shalom. He calls he calls the name of the place the, the God who, who gives peace. And same thing with Abraham in Genesis 22, where he encounters the Lord, and all of a sudden he steps into this reality, and he meets God in a way that he had not known him. And that's what I want to pray for, that we, even those who know him, will encounter him in ways that we have not yet experienced him. Come on, Chris. And Keep that down. for our sons and daughters, we will encounter him in that way. So, Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, we thank you that you're drawing us deeper and you're drawing us out of the place where we 
are simply existing on shadows and types and you're calling us into the place of substance and reality where we taste and see of your goodness we taste and see of your justice we taste and see of your righteousness and father we declare that over our sons and daughters that they will not become lord they will not become yoked to systems of religion and tradition that pull them into a place of devotion to empty uh uh words but you are bringing them into the yoke that you promised in 11 us uh, uh, matthew eleven twenty nine. come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you shalom i will give you rest so lord we declare that these are sons and daughters and this generation is coming into a place of ceasing from their own labors that they're coming into the place where they will be yoked not to learn from you but to learn of you so lord we declare over them that they will learn of you of your person of your goodness of your mercy of your long suffering and your faithfulness we declare those encounters over our sons and daughters in jesus name amen i, I want to jump right in on this chris because i i totally agree and you know um the Lord is really shaking all of us. He's shaking everything that can be shaken. And he wants to encounter us in a very personal way in the midst of the, the shakings that are going on. Um, the Lord alerted this uh, to Jolene and me a couple of years ago. We wrote about it in our book, uh, Turnaround Decrees. We also wrote about it, uh, prophesied it actually in our book, White House Watchmen. But there's a scripture in Isaiah, in the year King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord seated on mm. the throne, lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he, Isaiah was so moved uh, by this encounter where he encountered God personally. He, he was on his face. He saw the majesty of God. And he said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Yeah, yeah. And I dwell in the midst of the people, <clears throat> excuse me, in the midst of a people with unclean lips because my eyes have seen the Lord, the God of hosts. Now, this is something really important. It was in the midst of a grief over loss that Isaiah was encountered by God. In this case, Isaiah was kind of like the prophet and personal intercessor for a governmental leader in Israel named Uzziah. He was the king. And all of a sudden, Uzziah was judged by God and removed. And he, he was grieved over this in a profound way. And the Lord encountered him and showed him there is someone who's on the throne of the nation of israel this is my covenant land i've not forsaken and he brought isaiah into an encounter so often when we expect one thing and get another it it, it produces such dramatic yes, pain in our hearts but that pain can be an open door for you to encounter god yourself cling to him ask the lord to show himself to you he came to Isaiah in that point of need, and he, he brought a level of cleansing to Isaiah that Isaiah didn't even know he needed. Isaiah was the top, highest level prophet, prophetic voice. He was the guy that, I like to say this, you want on all your Zoom calls, you know, kind of like Chris Mitchell and Adam Schindler. He was a top guy, and yet... There was stuff in his heart he didn't even know was there. He said, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Wow. We can say across our nation that we are a people of unclean lips. Doesn't matter what your political ideology is, your religious ideology, what side of the fence you fall on at every given moment. Come on. We are busy making a, a divided nation out of our desire to be justified at the expense of others. Wow. And at some point in time, the division gets so great that we cease to truly be a union or we learn to be made strong by what every joint supplies. We learn that we are going to have to cling to the Lord in this time, know him personally. And guys, Every mother and father wrestles over this because we raise up our sons and daughters in the way of the Lord, but they have to make a decision for themselves. We can't yes, force sir. that decision upon them. 
we can pray and that prayer helps to prepare the way for them to have the encounter that they need and, and, and that deep in their hearts they desire so that they can have ownership of the faith of their fathers. We can't force it upon them. They have to have that personal relationship themselves. What we can do, as Chris and Adam have mentioned, is pray that they get in a circle with some American guy. <laughs> way through the gospel, way through the gospel whatever but i'm kind of kidding about that but uh, just as adam it was worked. impacted by lord we ask in jesus name that you pass the torch of faith and expand yeah. in our oh, sons and yes jesus the, yes the grace that you have granted us that has only come through relationship with you we ask that you enter them into that place of revelation. Open the eyes of their understanding, the eyes of their heart. According to Ephesians 1.17, grant them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, that the eyes of their heart, the eyes of their understanding, the eyes of their spirit be opened, that they see Jesus for who he is, that they see yes. his And we release to our sons and daughters and release to us as ministry leaders in the body of Christ and move across the body of Christ with this. We are asking in Jesus' name for an unveiling of your unshakable throne in the midst of the incredible shakings that are going on. Unveil your unshakable throne. Unveil your majesty. Unveil your glory. Break forth, Father, in a way that captures the heart captures the attention of this generation in Jesus name. Yeah. And I feel really strong during the whole time we've been talking, the Lord's kind of been showing me a picture of how our encounters with him become truth in our hearts. They become mm -hmm. truth in our spirits. And it's like when the enemy comes to accuse you or say something about someone else, when you've had an encounter with them, and you know them to be different than that person accusing, there's never any doubt in your heart about that. When you know your father to be a good and loving father, and someone yes. comes in and tells you something different than you know about him, you know for a fact that that isn't true. And I believe yep. part of what we need to pray for today is for new encounters for yes. us as people. New encounters that put the truth so far and so deep inside of us that when the enemy comes in and wants to speak a lie that, no, God isn't like that. Jesus isn't like that. He's not faithful. He's not going to come through. All the things that the enemy bombards us with, when we have an encounter with the true and loving God, we can then fight from our spirit because our spirit knows God to be different. So, Father, I pray that right now. I pray truth yes. encounters, right. encounters yes. with you, encounters that take us face to face with you, face to face with your character, with your faithfulness, with your love. Wow. All the ways that you are so powerful to us, Lord, so that those enemy attacks, I just see the uh, arrows of the enemy are flying very strong lately. And we mm -hmm. need our shields of faith up, but Lord, we need encounters with you. We wow. need to know that you're not, that is not the Jesus I serve. That is not the characteristic of God. He is faithful. He is true. He is coming after each one of our hearts. And you can't convince me otherwise because I know him and I know yeah. who he is. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Yes. Encounter us anew. Encounter us anew, Lord, so that our hearts can change in areas that the enemy has been accusing you, Lord we know you're different. Encounter mm. us and show mm. us again, God. Mm. In yeah. Jesus' name. Mm. Wow. That is that that is so powerful. And that's yes. This happened for <laughs> yes. I'm not even gonna add to that. 
Amen. <laughs> yes. This yes. happened. What you just prayed, Jolene, happened for my family on Friday night. And we wow. went to the Flashpoint Live thing in Atlanta, Georgia. And we sat yeah. on the second row and all my kids came and we didn't really know what to expect. And we kind of did, but about, well, two and a half hours into it, Hank Kuhneman and Mario Murillo started doing personal ministry and they started calling out words of knowledge and praying for people. And some people got healed. I was in the bathroom, so I missed it. Uh, <laughs> but I come back down. And that happens. And my is sitting here. Hi. And my Hi. daughter. Hey. She's on her. And they're all in the back. But I come down and they're like, my daughter Gabriella said, Dad, did you see all that? Or she said, You better have been watching the phone in your in the bathroom. Did you see all that? I'm like, No. <laughs> she knows that's what I do. And, <laughs> and she's like TMI. <laughs> well, sorry. Oh, like you don't take your cell phone. In. <laughs> so, and but that can be either confirm or deny. Is, my wife is I like, know, well, get to your story. Them, so that oh. I ruined the anointing. But she said there was people just got healed. Jesus was just healing people. And both, all three of my kids. My oldest is very thoughtful. She took all of it in. But Judah looked at me, and his hands were shaking. And he's like, I can't believe I just watched a healing. And we had been watching The Chosen again, and we had just seen the episode uh, when Jesus is healing in the midst of his tent, and he comes out after a day of doing ministry, he's exhausted, and Stephanie was telling the kids, it's just like that. And the point yeah. is, is that, I mean, we've talked to them about healing, and they've heard the voice of God for themselves, right. but they were in a crowd of 4,000 people, and they watched the power of God come out, and it impacted them, right? And we passed... And it wasn't even something that Stephanie and I did. We just were there when the anointing was present and the generational gift of healing and faith for that kind of stuff was passed to my kids on Friday my in gosh. a way that just, you know, got in their hearts. And I don't know how it's going to work out. And we didn't, you know, do a memory Bible verse memorization. It was an encounter <laughs> where they experienced that. And now they have context for all the Bible verses and stuff. That's but right. So anyway, that passing of that generational thing to the next generation so that they know that the Father is good, that it's part of the covenant promise that he heals, that, that's it. So that was a long amen. <laughs> hey, and amen. You know, it, there's nothing that beats going before the face of God and experiencing his love and experiencing his power. And uh, with we with unveiled face behold his glory yes. and changed into his likeness. Yeah. So one of the things we want to do here is we want to invite you to Fanwell Hall, Boston, Massachusetts on 722 on July 22nd. We're going to gather at Fanwell Hall, Boston. So glad that Adam and Stephanie are going to be joining us as well as Chris Mitchell, Jolene and myself. Dutch Sheets will be with us as well. I think Dutch was at the Flashpoint gathering. He's going mm -hmm. to be with us. Very excited about what he is going to bring. But we're going there first and foremost to seek God's face. You know, it's really interesting. Fenwell Hall is known as the, and it will be patriotic here. Uh, our foundations of freedom were really forged in Fenwell Hall, Boston. It's known as the cradle of liberty, the womb of the American Revolution, because all Boston gathered there to decide to support uh, the idea of making a break from England and becoming our own nation, getting out from subservience and becoming the covenant nation that we are called by God to be. And that would actually happen at Fanwell Hall. Interestingly enough, the name Fanwell is Hebrew. It's Hebraic. A French guy had the name, but it was a French guy probably with Jewish roots because the name Fanwell literally is, it's a variant of Peniel or Fanwell, it is Hebrew for face of God. So really, the American Revolution was birthed out of times literally before the face of God and face of God Hall. And we received in 2014 a Daniel 722 verdict of justice in favor of the saints from Fanwell Hall that continues to this day. We call it the turnaround verdict. Um, and we're going on 722 to come before the face of God again 
God is summoning us together before his face to es establish and release his verdict of justice that brings us together with him and together with each other and advances his cause in this hour, yes. I believe it is going to be revolutionary in the finest, most positive way. We celebrated yesterday uh, the birth of our nation uh, with the revolution that came as a result of that Declaration of Independence. We entered into freedom in a way that nations of the earth uh, uh, had never seen. There was a precedent set when we rejected monarchy and said all men are created equal, that they are endowed by God with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This was a precedent among nations who basically regarded the royalty as the supreme beings and the rest of humanity as subservient. We came into our own and celebrate every year the fact that we rejected bondage and entered into freedom. Now God wants to perpetuate that freedom and he wants to release the vision for this free freedom and the vision for the value of this freedom to the next generations. So join us at Fanwell Hall, Boston, the historic Fanwell Hall, as we seek together the face of God to see his turnaround verdict received and released in a way that catapults you personally and catapults this nation into his best heart for our future. Amen. There's so many great moments of Hanai or face-to-face -face moments in the scripture. One of my favorites is Exodus 17, when God comes down in front of Moses and he says, I will stand face to face with you here at the rock. And when you strike the rock, living water will come out of it. And I just want to believe, and I just want to pray this, living God, Amen. we thank you, God, that you stood face to face, Father, with our sin and our darkness. Father, and just like in the Exodus, Jesus stood face to face with you and with the darkness and the earth. But when you struck your son, living water flew out of his belly and living water flows out of our belly. And so, Father, we just pray for this 722 event in Boston, God, that you would stir up the fountains of the deep yeah. living water in everyone that comes, God. And we declare a bursting forth on this day out of Boston that the face to face yes. encounters with God, there would be rivers of living water flowing out of our bellies, God. And yes. your, your word says in John 7 that it's not about the living water flowing out of Jesus. It's not even about that flowing out of the temple as Ezekiel prophesies. You said, Jesus, it's about flowing out of the believers, the belly, yes. the, the core, the heart of the believer is a raging torrent of living water from a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And so we believe you, God, for this. We prophesy and declare this over 722 at Fenwell Hall in Boston. We thank you, Jesus, for this time you've set aside. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Oh, well, thank you. This has been very powerful. And uh, please continue throughout the rest of this day to contend in prayer for your sons and daughters. Uh, we bless you. And I just want to finish up this uh, uh, broadcast by declaring uh, number 624 over you. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. God bless you, everybody. The Lord is contending for you and he's saving your children. Amen.